Quando a Unibis me convidou para idealizar esse centro cultural, um dos grandes pensadores que estavam permeando o meu entendimento sobre o que é um desafio para a sociedade de hoje, tinha muito a ver com o que a Land Buton transmite no seu cotidiano. Então, muito obrigado à The School of Life e ao Land Buton. Sou Bruno Assami, diretor executivo da Unibis Cultural, e é um enorme prazer receber aqui a The School of Life, representada pela Jack de Buton e pela Diana Gabani e seu fundador, Alain de Buton. Que também, junto com a BMI, com seu fundador, Daniel Mota, em parceria com a Unibrad e o Bradesco, nos possibilitaram fazer este dia de hoje. Como o nome já diz, este In Conversation é uma oportunidade de conversa entre duas pessoas, dois pensamentos. Sobre, e o tema de hoje é sobre o relacionamento no trabalho, trazendo reflexões e insights sobre os como os indivíduos podem buscar uma vida mais plena através dessa redefinição do significado do trabalho em suas mentes e suas emoções. E por que nós, cinco organizações, nos unimos em esforço para a realização dessa jornada de manhã? Porque nós construímos um desejo comum. Nós acreditamos nessa sociedade. Somos parte do lado da fruta que olha o mundo de uma forma transformadora e civilizatória. Acreditamos fundamentalmente que o indivíduo tem um papel seminal a isso. Temos um pacto de consciência sobre os fatos que nos cercam e essa é a nossa jornada e a nossa agenda. Estamos diante de um cenário de grande transformação, sem dúvida nenhuma. Mas o que nos torna não somente as decisões de negócios mais desafiadoras, como a forma que as pessoas se relacionam sobre isso. Já sabemos que as emoções afetam as vidas das pessoas, da mesma forma como a economia. Assim, a forma como as pessoas lidam com suas emoções no trabalho certamente afetará a cultura da empresa e, consequentemente, os seus resultados. Nós, líderes, olhamos para tudo isso como uma imensa oportunidade de reflexão e de ação, seja na vida pessoal, seja na vida profissional. Acreditamos nessas pessoas e acreditamos no poder que elas têm de transformar essas organizações através das relações de confiança e de empatia. Alain, Daniel, para finalizar, não, poderia, não poderíamos ter o maior privilégio dessa reflexão com vocês dois juntos aqui hoje. Ambos compartilham essa mesma paixão intelectual sobre a análise dessas novas dinâmicas da vida, do trabalho e das possibilidades de relacionamento. Nosso muito obrigado por vocês terem aceito esse chamamento. A Unibrad e o Bradesco, obrigado por estar aqui conosco sempre quando o tema é uma proposição desafiadora e inovadora sobre o indivíduo na sociedade. Obrigado a vocês mais uma vez pela presença e que tenhamos essa manhã uma rica troca de conhecimento. Por questões práticas, é, o amigo e jornalista Leão Serva estará aqui mediando esse trabalho e ele abre com perguntas para que a gente possa desenvolver até o período das 9h20. Depois disso, as perguntas de vocês devem ser encaminhadas por escrito e dirigidas a eles, já com a equipe de apoio recolhendo essas perguntas. Sugiro que vocês se identifiquem na própria pergunta. Então, bom dia. Leão, obrigado, bem-vindo. É, muito obrigado, Bruno. Obrigado, Onibes. Obrigado a vocês todos por estarem aqui hoje conosco. Eu acho que é uma honra estar com essas duas uh, figuras pensantes tão importantes. É, e, portanto, eu não vou tomar o seu tempo, vou logo chamá-los. Uh, professor Alain de Buton, por favor. Opa. Thank you. Have your seat, please. E Daniel Mota. É... Então, por favor, é, eu acho que vocês podem ficar sentados, não? Obrigado, bom trabalho. Um, sorry, I, um, I just come here. Um, 
first of all, thank you so much for coming here. I know it's quite early um, and for listening to uh, us. Um, what we want to talk about today is emotional intelligence at work and a new way of working together uh, in a way that's going to help the workforce and help profitability. But I want to start with a very basic question. Is there anyone here who goes to work expecting that their work will make them happy? Anybody here who goes to work in order to try and be happy? Wow, it's amazing. You mean, you, mean you, you, you don't just go to work to get money and then to suffer? You, you don't? Very strange. No, I'm, I'm kidding. You're very normal. In the modern world, nowadays, we expect to go to work and find not just a source of money, but also a source of contentment, companionship, and meaning. And in a way, this is wonderful. This is a wonderful dream. And at the other level, it's a disaster because it's so complicated. It was so much easier when all you needed from your work was just some money. Also, let it be said, management used to be easier. For thousands of years, the only thing that you needed to manage your workforce was a whip. So all you needed to do if your workers were not working hard enough was to hit them. Uh, sadly, this is not possible anymore. So I, I'm joking, um, but, but you understand. This is how British people operate. Um, but, but seriously, for most of history, shouting, violence, brutality, raw power were the instruments of management. If you behave like this now, not only will you not be seen as a very nice person, you will not have a business. Within 24 hours, your business will have closed down. Um, so kindness, gentleness, sympathy, collegiality, these things are not just nice. They're not just uh, a sign that you may, um, in your next life, go to the priesthood. They are a sign that you are a good business person. It makes good business sense. And that is because we have entered the age of psychology. For most of human history, the way in which profits were made was through raw power through the power of the human muscle or animal muscle. Now, all important profits are made through the mind, through intelligence. And the thing about the mind is it is a very delicate instrument. And if somebody upsets that mind by not asking in the right way how your weekend was, or not smiling at you in exactly the right way when you've made a suggestion in a meeting, this mind from which is produced all the profit of your company, this mind will shut down. It will go on strike. It will not operate properly. So, even if you don't like your fellow human beings, you'd better start to like your fellow human beings if you want to run an effective organization in the age of psychological business and psychological profit. You know, at the School of Life, we deal with emotional intelligence at work, and I spend a lot of time sitting with CEOs of very powerful corporations in the UK and around the world, and the first meeting always goes like this. They say, well, it's very nice. You're interested in, like, philosophy? Oh, my daughter's interested in philosophy. And they say, are you interested in art? Oh, yes. My wife once went to an art gallery, but really, how can I help you? And I say, no, 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 we're here to help you. And they say, ah, uh -huh. why? And I say, well, because there are lots of things going on in your organization that have to do with psychology. They look a little bit puzzled, but gradually we show them that psychology and a misfunctioning psychological um, aspect in an organization is possibly the most serious thing that can go wrong in a company. You know, we spend a lot of time in companies thinking about strategy, thinking about technology, thinking about competitor analysis. The one thing we spend so little time doing is thinking about this. This is the most complicated machine that any of you ever employ, and you don't really know how it works. When a new employee comes in, you look at their CV, you look at whether they've been to the right school, the right university, have got the right grades. This tells you about 5% of the effectiveness of that worker. The other 95% is psychological. I'd like to ask you something. If you think of some of the most difficult, troublesome people in your company, just Take a moment to think about people who drive you crazy inside your business. We all have them, right? Um, we all have people who are somehow annoying, all right? So can you, can you now just think of some annoying people? Just, just think of one really annoying person in your organization, okay? And um, because we're among friends now, um, can you just tell me, without telling me their name, what's wrong with them? 
What, 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 what is wrong with this person that is really kind of driving you nuts in your organization? Just put up your hand. As I say, we're going to be in private here. We're not going to talk about this afterwards. So, who, who, who drives you a little bit crazy in your organization? Anybody want to be brave? And to, you, as I say, please don't tell me their name. Who, who is it? Any, anybody want to volunteer? Come on, you guys are Brazilians. You're open. You're, you're, yeah, you know what I mean? Like the kind of person who's a bit annoying at the office. Do you have one of those? Yes, go. F Sorry? Yes, yeah, so tell me about them. What, what are they like? What do they do? Right, okay, so they're, they're slow, they're, they're, they don't have much initiative, okay, they don't have much get up and go, okay, fantastic. fantastic. Anybody else with a, a colleague that's a little, you know, not, not, you know, kind of annoying in some way, anybody else? Yes, yes, please, shout your answer. Cause... Yes, go for it. She can, right, okay, so it's, it's always somebody else's fault. Okay, okay. Okay, so look, thank you. By the way, thank you. You've been very brave. Thank you. Um, I'm sure others of you are very discreet. You just don't know this strange man who's asking you these questions. I'm sorry. But, um, but look, what would, now normally, normally, when you have somebody who's a little slow in the office and like you're trying to gear them up, etc., or somebody who always complains that it's somebody else's fault or is maneuvering around somebody else, right? Normally, we think, huh, it's like the weather. You cannot change this. This is just part of psychology. I bet that these two people probably have an excellent CV, right? So when you, when you look at the CV, this person was probably educated and, yeah, you're nodding, good university, good grades, good recommendations, et cetera, right? We know everywhere. You can go to Harvard, et cetera, et cetera. When you look at the CV of this person, it doesn't tell you the psychological problem that comes with them. What do we normally do when we have these psychological problems? We gossip. You know gossip, basically? We go, God, that person over there. It's so annoying, and you don't know what to do about it. You don't know how to deal with it. Now, gossip is for the 20th century. We're in the 21st century. We're looking to how we will run organizations in the future. You cannot simply despair and gossip of your employees that are difficult. All of us have difficult employees and difficult teams, and it has nothing to do with a lack of technical training. For most of the 20th century, we thought that organizations didn't work properly because they lacked technical training. So all the business schools were built to give people technical skills. And now we arrive in 2018 and we realize the problem is not there. That you can train somebody up to every last MBA, but if they have a psychological problem, they might as well have just come out of primary school, okay? Because you won't benefit at all. So the School of Life is dedicated to trying to understand the psychological problems that exist within businesses and trying to fix them. Now, what on earth are the psychological problems in businesses? You know, you said um, uh, a slowness, lack of initiative. Um, uh, uh, the, you said also the idea of complaining that it's somebody else's fault. These are classic ones. These are on my list. At the School of Life, we identified 12 problems, having studied hundreds of organizations and distilled our learning. There are about 12 very difficult behaviors that constantly show up in the psychology of the workplace and will be costing you millions and millions every year without you even knowing. The number one, I'm not going to run through them all because we don't have time, but just to give you a flavor, the number one is defensiveness. Okay, what we call defensiveness. What is defensiveness? It is the inability to hear difficult news about your performance without making it a judgment on your whole character and therefore fighting back and saying, it's not true, it's your fault, it's not my fault, etc. Defensiveness, the arms crossed of the defensive person is a major business problem. Okay, the problem is if you say to somebody, I think you're a little defensive, you'll have a double defensive reaction. So you need to be very careful and there are strategies you have to follow. The last thing you can do to a defensive person is to tell them they're defensive. Disaster. Okay, you need to walk around the problem. By the way, like most psychological problems at the office, they begin in childhood. They begin in the family. The School of Life is a psychotherapeutic organization. This doesn't mean that we bring a couch into the office, but our thinking, when we're thinking about human beings and difficulties in the workplace, we are learning from the insights of psychotherapy, which we think work. The reason why we did this is because we think it works. So there's defensiveness. The other thing is we don't know how to teach. 
Now, some people say, I'm not a teacher, I'm in business. No, if you're in business, you're a teacher. If you're a parent, you're a teacher. If you're a lover, you're a teacher. If you're a human being, you have to teach. What do I mean by teaching? Teaching is the delicate, complicated art of getting an idea from my head into the other person's head without causing drama. It is one of the most difficult arts there is. It is not given by nature. You can learn it. There are classes you can do in how to become a better teacher. Mostly, we don't do it. We are angry with people for not understanding what is inside our minds, even though we haven't bothered to tell them. So we get furious and we go, why on earth aren't they sending the emails correctly? Why have they misunderstood the client need again, etc.? And the real reason is you never told them. They don't know. And the reason you didn't tell them is that you don't have much faith in other human beings and their capacity to learn. All of this needs to be corrected. The other thing is we need good students. Now, most people who arrive in offices go, well, I'm highly trained and I'll take a lesson from you in you know, computer science or forecasting. I'm not taking a lesson in psychology. Well, we have to change company culture and say, no, what makes a good leader, what makes a, a powerful person in an organization is somebody who is willing to enter into their psychology and use it for the benefit of uh, uh, the team. The other terrible psychological dynamic, it's everywhere in Brazil, in Britain, is the dynamic that we call people-pleasing. What is people-pleasing? People-pleasing is when you want to make other people happy, but instead you make them very unhappy because you never tell them what is important to tell them. You merely tell them the good news of that day, and you store the bad news till later on. And that you end up with massive problems uh, down the line. It's a cultural problem, and you need to change the culture within an organization so that bad news ceases to be taboo and in fact becomes rewarded. So the bosses go, have you brought me some bad news today? And if somebody says no, you go, oh, I hope you will try and bring me some bad news because I need bad news. Every time you are brought bad news by someone in your organization, it's a good day. Okay? If you're only ever hearing good news, you haven't understood your organization and they haven't understood you. Okay? So this is a major psychological uh, 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 block. Then there are others. I mean, we look at things like paranoia. You know, one of the main problems that people have in offices sometimes, especially at the boss level, is if you don't like yourself very much, it's very easy to imagine that other people don't like you very much and to immediately start to imagine that there are plots against you and that people are talking about you and that there, there are people trying to punish you and that there are maybe people trying to bring you down, etc. It's a paranoid way of thinking that has its origins always in something rather touching and sad. You don't like yourself very very much. So one of the things we do at the School of Life is do an audit of, very honestly, how much do you like yourself? Are you a friend to yourself? And therefore, can you accept the goodwill of others? Or are you always looking in an office for enemies? Because if you do this all the time, you will actually end up generating enemies, and on and on. Now, once we've identified some of the key psychological problems in offices, at the School of Life, we do something very important. When we work with an organization, we have to change, first of all, the culture. It is no good saying to people, well, you've got that problem about people pleasing, and you've got that problem about paranoia, and you've got that problem uh, about cynicism, or whatever. If you point the finger at individuals within your organization, nothing will happen. The only way of making progress is for the whole organization to declare on one very special day, normally with our help, everybody in this organization is a bit crazy. I mean that nicely. Everybody has things to learn. Everybody is psychologically immature, and everybody is on a journey towards greater maturity. It has to come from the CEO downwards. It's no good if you pick on a few people down below and ask them to admit to their flaws. No, it has to come right from the top. The CEO has to go, I've made 100 mistakes. I'm often this. I'm sometimes that. I regret being this, etc. Far from losing respect, this gives you enormous respect. Because if you're able to show that level of vulnerability, everybody rallies around you. So what I mean to say is this is a culture-wide problem. And it, you know, it has to change at the cultural uh, level. The other thing, at the School of Life, 
we come into organizations, and that's a very good thing for organizations, because it's very hard for an organization to go, you know what, we've just been reading about psychotherapy and thinking about the psychology of the office and blah, 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 and so now we're going to organize something. You can't run your business and at the same time be business psychologists. It's very useful if you get people from the outside, because then they come in, no one really knows who they are, they're friendly, no one has to think, who are these people in relation to my own team, etc.? They are outsiders. They'll come in for a little bit of time and then they'll go away again. And those people are the people who become like priests within the organization. They hear the secrets, they, they are very confidential, but they help to maneuver the business in a more uh, uh, positive direction. So we have a suite of 20 classes and we put uh, organizations through a program of 20 different classes suited to a range of issues that we discuss with you. We they do a diagnostic and then we angle a variety of classes to the psychological issues which we feel and you feel are the most alive in your organizations and that's how we progress. So in a way, psychology in the workplace we feel is really the future of profitable, good organizations. It isn't a luxury. It's not some add-on. It's not like spending the day in the museum or something. This is practical, goal-oriented, and the only way, ultimately, of making the best use of the people you work with is to understand them properly and make sure that they understand you properly. Thank you. Alan. Uh, it's a great honor to have you here with us. We have a very selective audience here with us this morning, and uh, we will be very happy to share your reflections, your questions about anything you'd like to, to ask, uh, either for Alan or myself. Uh, in this short introduction, I will to, I, I'm, I have to speak in Portuguese because I, I will not be speaking from my mind but from my heart. So it's very difficult to speak from your heart in a foreign language. So I have to, I ask Alan his permission to speak in Portuguese uh, only during this introduction. Um, bom, acho que a gente não teria um encontro como esse se a gente estivesse há 30, 40 anos atrás. A gente tem um encontro como esse porque todos nós aqui estamos nos perguntando o que, que nós estamos fazendo hoje com o ambiente de trabalho? A quantidade de doenças mentais no ambiente de trabalho só aumenta, a quantidade de pessoas com burnout também só aumenta, as pessoas não têm encontrado no ambiente de trabalho um ambiente de felicidade, de produtividade, um ambiente no qual elas de fato desejem fazer parte. E isso porque a gente está num processo de uma transição extremamente complexa que é importante a gente ter uma visão sistêmica sobre ela. Quer dizer, não é só o ambiente de trabalho que está se modificando, mas a sociedade na qual nós estamos inseridos está se modificando. E a organização é só uma das várias vertentes das nossas facetas sociais. E o que está acontecendo nessa sociedade? A gente costuma dizer que as organizações foram desenhadas em final do século XVIII, início do século XIX, e se desenvolveram no início do século XX, inspiradas por estruturas militares que foram organizadas para aumentar a produtividade do trabalho. Não necessariamente o trabalho era visto como um lugar de busca de felicidade, mas sim como um espaço social onde você recebe dinheiro, você recebe status para viver feliz fora dele. O próprio cartão de ponto significa justamente isso. Você chega de manhã, bate o cartão de ponto, trabalha, 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 bate o cartão de ponto no final da tarde e volta para sua casa, volta para o final de semana, para férias ou para uma aposentadoria bucólica, idílica que você sonha em ter um dia. Mas as, âncoras, as âncoras psicossociais que significam as nossas vidas estão em plena transformação. E é sobre isso que a gente pode discutir hoje aqui. Nós costumamos dizer que nós, com cada um de nós aqui, diante da certeza da morte, nós significamos a nossa vida em quatro grandes âncoras psicossociais. A primeira delas é a família, a segunda é a comunidade na qual vivemos, a segunda é a noção de povo, de pátria e, finalmente, a relação de espiritualidade, seja ela qual for. Só que nesses últimos 50 anos, todas essas, essas âncoras psicossociais se transformaram radicalmente. As famílias ficaram menores, voláteis e fragmentadas. As comunidades se tornaram móveis, digitais, onde as pessoas não têm mais uma vida de vizinhança, 
de convivência com a pessoa que mora a metros de distância e sonha com a possibilidade de se relacionar digitalmente com pessoas por meio de Instagram, WhatsApp e outras redes sociais. A noção de povo se torna cada vez mais fluida à medida que a gente vive uma vida cada vez mais cosmopolita e menos, como no nosso caso aqui no Brasil, com cada vez menos brasilidade. Soma-se a isso o um certo asco que sentimos em relação ao governo, por tantos escândalos globais e locais, no nosso caso no Brasil, em relação às finanças públicas. E a própria relação espiritual, ela tem sido ressignificada num mundo onde a gente está muito mais preocupado com materialização e com respostas concretas e objetivas, e menos com o espaço de reflexão, seja ele com que Deus ser, que Deus for. Isso coloca uma transição de ética social, de uma ética do dever, onde nós temos uma programação mental voltada para obrigações, voltadas para a obediência, para uma transição para uma ética do prazer, onde na ausência de família, comunidade, nação e espiritualidade, só sobra você no espelho. E essa busca desesperada pela autossatisfação, pelo auto prazer, ela é simbolizada pela obsessão que temos hoje pelo selfie. Essa obsessão que tem, as pessoas hoje morrem mais de selfie do que de picada de bicho peçonhento, por exemplo. Não é? Isso é estatístico, inclusive. E nessa, nessa ética do prazer, o espaço das organizações precisa ser, sim, desafiado. Na ética do dever, o vínculo empregatício, a lealdade, a estabilidade profissional era suficiente, porque você não tinha como expectativa, aspiração ou necessidade no ambiente corporativo de significar a sua vida por meio do trabalho, salvo pessoas que tiveram a sorte de viverem de acordo com seus dons, com pessoas bastante interessantes. Mas para a grande maioria, isso não era uma aspiração. Na ética do prazer, o trabalho também é um espaço de realização pessoal. Por quê? Porque a vida está focada na autossatisfação. E aqui a gente pode falar sobre três demandas que são cada vez mais prementes no ambiente corporativo. A primeira é pertencer a um ambiente organizacional onde você lute por um impacto, por uma causa, que tem alguma coisa além do que bit da earnings per share ou preço da ação no final do ano. As pessoas estão em busca de impacto. A segunda questão é a experiência. A gente fala bastante de customer experience, jornadas de clientes, mas falamos menos sobre job experiences, sobre a tentativa de formarmos experiências significativas para as pessoas. E, finalmente, a questão de expressão. Nunca se falou tanto de expressão. Por isso que o tema diversidade hoje também está tão em voga e na pauta dos comitês executivos. A busca pela expressão não é só a expressão da minha persona, das minhas preferências sexuais, das minhas opiniões políticas ou das, enfim, das minhas visões de mundo, mas é a expressão daquilo que eu penso, daquilo que eu posso fazer sem respeito necessariamente à hierarquia das pessoas que se posicionam acima de mim. Então, diante desse contexto, e acho que é uma das, um dos temas que a gente pode conversar aqui com o Alain. A gente pode ter uma visão utópica, aonde o trabalho, de fato, se transforma no eixo de significação da vida, aonde as pessoas conseguem encontrar o equilíbrio das outras demandas que nós, todos nós temos por meio do seu trabalho. Ou também podemos ter uma visão distópica, aonde a incapacidade das lideranças dessas organizações em transformar o um ambiente corporativo num ambiente mais produtivo e saudável, aderente a essas novas demandas, torne o um ambiente corporativo cada vez mais patológico, aonde as doenças mentais se proliferam e as pessoas de fato percam de vez qualquer chance de engajamento com o ambiente, com o ambiente de trabalho. Então essa, essa é a minha introdução, a gente pode ir para as perguntas aqui comigo e com a Alain. Obrigado. Nós estamos começando a receber algumas perguntas. Eu queria começar com uma pergunta para ambos. How do you both work to improve the creativity in your organizations? Being creativity is exactly the capacity to create the unthinkable. How can you objectively improve creativity in organizations? Um, I think the best way to improve uh, creativity so the best way to improve creativity is to reduce the amount of fear. Um, you know, the, uh, the English child psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott um, uh, made a, uh, wrote a lot about the concept of play, 
Why is it that children play? And why do adults no longer play? What do we mean by play? Play is largely activity without heavy consequence. When you play as a child, you can move things around, you can decide you're a pirate, you can rearrange the living room, and none of it has very serious consequences at that time. In other words, you can decide you're a pirate and you will chop the head off your sister and your sister will be fine, and later on you'll have lunch together. It's not so serious because it is a game. Um, the reason why adult life has so little play in it and so uh, little creativity, therefore, is that the consequences are so huge. And we constantly deal with companies that say things like, um, we really want our employees to be creative and to try out taking risks. And then you analyze what actually happens to somebody in that organization if they were to have a new initiative and to take a risk. And you know what tends to happen? They're either fired, sidelined, or humiliated. And then people wonder, well, why don't we have a more creative environment? So you don't need to set up a playroom with a table tennis table. You simply need to look at the hidden disincentives to creativity, which is always a structure of fear around somebody who departs from the company's norms. Uh, there's a question from the, the audience, uh, which is, uh, the, all the studies pr uh, show that the technology is a, a, a main reason of distraction nowadays. At the same point, at, at the same time, it's a very important tool uh, in the, the companies. And how do you uh, think that technology affects the relationships in the work? And should, should we use it, uh, social media and so on, uh, or avoid it in the working place? Uh, please, Daniel, start. Well, um, I think it's impossible to think about corporate life without any, any, any technology. So technology is part of, of, the, of the way of, uh, that we work and, uh, and uh, interact with everyone. But what we have seen uh, since the, the past years is that people are trying, to, uh, uh, people are, are associating reward, rewards with uh, social media, for instance. So then the number of likes and uh, how famous you are with your post uh, somehow affects your perception about yourself um, on, on a reward perspective. So uh, in, a, in, the, in the corporate world, I think one of the way in order to avoid the distraction caused by technology would, uh, would could be to find a new meaning about technology in, in a way that we can uh, position it as an, as an enabler, not as an end in itself. So one of the things that we try to do is to leave the concept of be here now in order to have separate times in, to use technology, for instance, using social media, interaction, etc. But during a meeting, I mean, a very few people can say it can be multitask. Most of us need concentration in order to have a productive interaction with each other. So one of the ways that we can foster a better use of technologies, uh, technologies would be to separate uh, the, the, the usage when we are interacting in a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting versus uh, our, our times in social media, for instance. Thank you, that's brilliant. Um, I, I might just add one tiny thing. I think what's interesting to think about is um, why do we use uh, our phones manically? And I think we often use our phones in order not to think. Um, many of the ideas that we have in our heads are important but a little bit frightening. What I mean by this is you get home at the end of the day and you know, you know that there was something you were supposed to do for that Swiss client. Or you know that there was maybe a need to reorganize the team in Belo Horizonte. Um, maybe there was something that you needed to do with a folder which is coming from LA. Something like this. And it makes you so kind of 
frazzled and annoyed and whatever. That what you do is you pick up your phone and you just check Twitter because it's somehow relaxing. It somehow cuts off those thoughts. Now, one of the big problems of all modern businesses is people don't think enough, right? I mean, modern businesses are brilliant at execution and terrible at strategy, right? All of you in the room are much better at execution than strategy. We should probably have, you know, 50% more uh, strategy thinking and a lot less execution thinking, right? Because most of what goes wrong in organizations is not that we've executed the wrong, uh, executed a project wrong. It's that we had the wrong project that we were trying to execute. And why did we have the wrong project? Because, and it sounds totally naive, you were not thinking hard enough. And the reason you weren't thinking hard enough is thinking is very hard. Thinking br brings with it anxiety. And thirdly, and most importantly, we have smartphones. And smartphones make us into idiots. Um, they stop us thinking, and therefore, they, they literally lead our organizations into disasters. As I say, what leads organizations to disasters is always a lack of thinking. One of the best places to work is your shower. Right? The shower is probably the best place to work. Next to the shower, the walk in the countryside. Very useful as well. So if you have a dog, uh, it's very useful to have a dog and go for a walk with the dog. Anywhere where you are able to think. One cannot think at the office. You can't think in, at your desk. And you cannot think if you are within hitting range of your smartphone. So these are the conditions of thinking. And companies can only ever be as good as the amount of good thinking that goes on in them. I'm afraid that Apple will invent a mobile phone that works on the shower. <laughs> Soon. Uh, uh, many questions are coming, uh, talking about uh, conservative or um, existing uh, uh, 20th, 100th, 20th century companies uh, changing into this new environment. Um, how can we do, deal with this, uh, the changing of the uh, old companies, let's say? Um, so, do you have any example of successful companies that have made this change? And uh, how you uh, would uh, uh, make them change into a new, uh, a new 21st century company? Well, I, I think we have to separate the companies that were born last century from the companies that uh, were born in this new era of uh, pleasure, if, you, if I may say in this way. So, and, and also, I think we have to separate small companies when you still have interaction with the founders, when you still have a connection of, as a community, a small community, from very large companies, especially those spread out through the world. Uh, I think there are completely different uh, problems to solve. When we're, when, if you are thinking about large companies from last century, one of the things that I, I, I feel that is very important is to reskill and, uh, and to, to foster unlearning top down. Uh, I think we, we learned th during the past years to work with power. Power is the, uh, is the ultimate uh, goal of uh, any successful top executive from a large company, especially global big companies. So if you, if you have a new meaning about what's the goal and, uh, and, uh, and uh, how can we be more uh, productive in our, in our interactions, in the, in, in, in the company, I think we have a beginning right there. And one of the things that I have been engaged with a few companies here in Brazil is uh, to help this uh, top management team to improve the level of trust to start with and also to find new meanings for traditional corporate symbols. Uh, if, you, if you are successful in those, I think, if you are successful in those two goals, I think we have a starting point in order to challenge something very ingrained in those, in those uh, large corporations. That's fascinating. And I mean, I think um, 
you know, human beings need meaning in their lives. You need to get up in the morning and you need to have a sense of purpose. What is your bigger purpose other than just surviving till the next night? And the other thing about human beings is we forget meaning very quickly. All of us, I mean, not just, you know, even outside of the corporate space, we sometimes forget what we're doing, why it matters, and who we are. Literally, we wake up sometimes and think, who am I quite? What am I doing with my life? Sometimes on a Sunday evening, before returning to work on the Monday, you have a kind of crisis of meaning, and you think, what, what am I trying to do? Where's my life going, etc." Now, individuals do this, and companies have exactly, on a macro scale, they have exactly the same problem. They, too, have crises of meaning. The meaning is there somewhere in the organization, somewhere in a drawer. Someone once commissioned you know, a consultant to write down the meaning of the organization. But actually, everyone's sort of forgotten it. So what I think an organization needs, in particular, as you were saying, to do with size, is constantly remind itself of its meaning. Now, I think by meaning, I have in mind one thing, really. Meaning in work comes from a sense that you are helping other people. And it sounds odd because we always think that we only want to work for ourselves, etc. But really, a, f a sense of purpose and meaning comes from being able to help another human being, either by reducing their suffering and frustration or by increasing their pleasure and fulfillment. And almost all organizations do this. I mean, everything from the hospital to the uh, 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 department store to the hotel, they're all at some level in the business of either increasing pleasure or reducing pain. But the problem, and you put it so well, is scale. The problem of modern organizations is scale. You know, there's a real reason why we like football so much. The reason why we love football is there's 11 players in a team, there's, it, the game is 90 minutes long, and there are only two goals. And that's really beautifully simple. Most modern organizations, if you translated them into the idiom of football, they, they would last about 180,000 hours. Uh, they would have you know, 20,000 people on a pitch. The pitch would spread from here to Rio. Um, there would be maybe 39 balls on the pitch, and it would be total chaos. So we can't quite see what's going on. And so we we can't see a narrative. We cannot see a story. So day to day, the person who is in the accounts department and the person who is in the, the branch 300 kilometers away or in the overseas office, they've lost sight of the story. They don't know what the game is. And so one of the very important functions that I think people like you and I can have in organizations is to remind an organization of its story. Literally, by telling the story, in the same way that nations forget their stories, and then they tell them, they use historians to remind themselves, what is it to be a Brazilian? What is it to be a French person, etc. Same problem goes on in organizations. We forget our purpose, but partly because of scale, partly because of time, and we need storytellers to remind us. There are two questions on schools, uh, universities and schools. Uh, so how would uh, the school of life change the way the schools are uh, function, in especially the universities, being a very old kind of organizations? Um, well, look, we, we slightly despair of changing the school and university system. If, you ha if your life is going to be 500 years long and uh, you have a lot of patience, then good luck trying to change the university system in Brazil or in the UK or in the US. It is like trying to change the direction, not just of an oil tanker, but a flotilla of oil tankers. It's a very, you know, because academics, they have their pensions, etc. Good luck trying to change them. We gave up trying to change them and started up our own uh, school. Um, but Look, what should you, I can tell you exactly what should be done. We, all you need to do is to reverse engineer from the problems of the average 55-year-old executive. If you stop the average 55-year-old executive and you say, what is it you could have wished that they would have taught you at Harvard Business School, you have your answer there. And they will tell you the answers are quite standard. They'll say things like, you know, technically it was brilliant, etc. I learned nothing about relationships, my own personal relationships. And frankly, I'm three divorces in, and I'm still learning. And this has cost me more than anything else, both in terms of time and money. Okay, so we would teach people about relationships as a business priority, not as some luxury for the weekend, but as a business priority. Okay, we would teach a lot around the area of status and of people's sense of reward and what is it they actually 
actually want, that we teach them about money uh, and what money is really for, why they want it, their own psychological relationship to money. You know, most people reach the age of 55 going, I've won, I've won. And then they think, what have I won? Have I won it for my father? But actually my father's dead. So what am I trying to compete with? What am I trying to achieve? Um, we would teach people uh, about the emotional side of judgment. You know, a lot of decisions are made with emotions, and we don't understand these emotions because we don't know where emotions are coming from. So an emotional approach to decision-making is something we teach and are very interested in, in, in exploring. And on and on and on. There are so many things that the curriculum needs to have added to, and modern corporations need to have a classroom in them. We need continuing education because all over the world, even the best so-called universities have lots and lots of holes in them. Well, uh, broadly speaking, uh, not specifically about the School of Life, but broadly speaking, I think these uh, universities and, uh, and uh, uh, schools, they are facing the same problems that we, are, that we have been describing that our organizations are facing as well. Uh, so uh, we have to remind, to remind that uh, elementary schools, they were designed to form and to develop employees uh, for the companies. So they were, they were a, a factory, I mean, they, they were a kind of machine, education machine, in order to provide blue collar and white collar uh, people for companies. So that, that, were, that used to be the main purpose of those uh, schools. I mean, before them, Children, they, they didn't learn inside a building. They, they had their own tutors, they, have, they, made, they have their mentors, they, they used to learn in their families, in their communities. But then, with the industrialization, the schools developed in this, uh, in this purpose of providing workforce for companies, especially factories. Nowadays, since we have artificial intelligence, we have machine, machine learning, big data, and all the new technology that can perform much better uh, a, a number of different activities, we have to rethink what's the role of schools right now. So maybe that's time to come back to Greece or to some philosophical perspective about education and teach our children how to think, as Alain is saying, uh, how to play better, how to, be, uh, how to develop better relationship, and of course, emotional intelligence as well. So I think the technical stuff uh, in, a, in a very near future any computer can help us to perform any task. But the social skills and the emotional skills and personal awareness, maybe that's a new role of, uh, of uh, schools in general. Not only our, uh, 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 not only exact education, but mainly uh, elementary schools and universities. I have two questions that are uh, interconnected. Uh, despite saying opposite, uh, we still reward people who work 1,000 hours a day. Uh, how to change it? That's one question. And the other is, do you guys think that uh, is it really possible to be fully happy at work? Hello. Um, well, you know, at the School of Life, we're a little bit suspicious of the idea of work-life balance. Because work-life balance has become this kind of mantra that if you're a good office, you offer work-life balance. Um, personally, and I'm sure that some of you in the room will agree with this, um, I'm not personally that interested in work-life balance. Uh, I mean, I love my life work. Um, I, I love my life uh, at home and my friends, etc. And, and I love my work. But frankly, if you said to somebody, which would you rather prefer? A really interesting life, a really meaningful life, 
or work-life balance. Right? I think most people would say a really meaningful life. And if you said, if you have a really meaningful life, sometimes you'll have to work all night, all weekend, and you have to give up your holiday. Right? That's what people who really are passionate about their work, that's how they work. And you know why? Because it's not work anymore. It's something else. It's a passion project. You know, did Michelangelo say, oh, I'm sorry, I've got to knock off now. I need work-life balance. You know, did Nietzsche say, I need a bit of work-life balance? No, no, he didn't. You know, did Dostoevsky, was he searching in his literary career for work-life balance? No, the, the question seems ridiculous, right? The, 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 the idea seems ridiculous. And, and the fact that it seems ridiculous is telling us something important. We realize that the more important work is, the sillier the concept of work-life balance sounds. Work-life balance is something you give your workforce when you've been unable to give them meaning. Okay? It's a, it's a consolation prize for being unable to give your workforce meaning. Now, of course, look, I'm exaggerating the point in order to make a point. Of course, we all need weekends. We all need holidays. I'm not stupid. But that said, I think that constantly say, we believe in work-life balance, we believe in work-life balance, Whenever I see a business that promotes that as the number one thing that they're doing, I think, what is their work that it requires life to be so close behind as a compensatory factor? Um, okay, uh, second question uh, about uh, can one be totally happy uh, at work? Here's a little secret at the School of Life. We always tell you this, even in relationships. It's not possible to be absolutely happy anywhere. Fortunately, going back to technology question, we have technology in our favor. So we, we are starting to replace, I can say in that, war, in, that in brackets, uh, boring uh, activities for machines. And the robots, they don't complain. And uh, they can work 24 hours a day, including weekends, and they don't complain at all. And uh, you don't have unions of robots as well. Uh, until now, uh, we don't, we, we're not aware of any new union about robots until now. So going back to the point, I think I agree with Alan when he says that if you have a completely connection with your work, with the way, with with the things that you are performing in your in your company, you don't you you don't have the question of work-life balance anymore. I mean, people, people who love, people who love their job, they work a lot. I mean, uh, several hours, and that don't make them feel uh, sick. Uh, or, yeah, and you can also have someone who only works four hours a day, and uh, is the, maybe there is not connected, and is sick uh, because of the job. So I don't think it's a. Uh, as it's, it's, the question is the amount of time dedicated to work, but your connection with work that matters. I have two questions on generation issue. Uh, it seems to me that the new generation is more self-oriented, not much engaged into corporate, in corporate needs, uh, and culture needs, objectives. They are only concerned uh, with their well-being. How to cope with this uh, new behavior in the companies? Personally, I don't like so much to talk about generation. Uh, I think it's very complicated to uh, set a stamp in someone only because of the year of the the they are they are born. I, mean, I think I think it's very complicated. But uh, I do believe that we have a few uh, uh, topics or a few characteristics that are, can be associated with the time that you are living. Not not specifically about your age, but the time that you are living in this world. So the, the, my contribution to that question would be that people here who have more than 40, 50 years old, you were all born in, the, in a different era. I mean, in the old days, as I, as I said in my introduction, 
the 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 role of of work was different. We used to work to pay to pay our bills and uh, to have uh, active play, uh, active role in society. And today we are trying to find a new meaning of work, and uh, that's not only a challenge for is young kids, but also for everyone here who has more than 50 years old, 50, 60 years old, 40 years old. What I think is different from the youngs or the small kids is that they didn't had they didn't have the experience of the old way of working. They are they are coming to the corporate world with a fresh mind and they are facing a few things that you guys don't care anymore and they are, ha and they are having a reaction. I, I, I don't like that. I, I, I think we could do that in a different way. So I think it's much more about a question of how we can work with, fre with fresh mind uh, young uh, fellows than to have a kind of uh, stamp to separate people be below certain age from the rest of us. There's a question more specific on cases that I would uh, um, bring to you. The AB InBev, the beverage uh, global company, is very successful and adopts a, a very strong command and controls, less creative culture. Spotify and Netflix are very success successful while being more decentralized and creative. Are there a right or wrong um, recipe or b between these companies? Well, uh, I cannot uh, make any comment about any company, but in a general perspective, what I would say is that uh, we don't have any recept. We have, what we can have is uh, learning lessons about some things that a few companies have done, uh, some of them worked, and we can try to get inspiration and, uh, and a few tips about how to solve uh, different problems. Uh, having said that, I also think that's impossible to copycat any culture that you might think that is successful to your own company because cultural, corporate culture and culture in general uh, is, is, is a sociological uh, process. Uh, people develop a specific culture by living together for several, uh, several years. And they learn together how to solve problems, to solve conflicts, to engage themselves, to punish themselves, to try to reward the good behavior and to avoid the bad behavior. So it's a learning journey. And uh, so it's impossible to see any company that you might admire and say, well, let's try to uh, do exactly what that company is doing, that's not possible. Even, let's think about the impossible stuff, even if you hire everyone from that company and put those uh, people in a new environment, that would be new. So it's not possible to uh, copycat, but it's, it's possible to learn from good examples. I just want to add, um, ultimately it comes down to what your company is making and doing, what is the service or product that you're offering, you have to work back from that service or product and, and those things will demand, each company in a given area will demand very different skills and processes and you cannot import skills and processes from other companies. So um, I, I almost think it's a warning sign. The minute a company goes, couldn't we be a bit more like Netflix, get worried because you're not Netflix, you're actually making rubber tires in the south of Brazil. So you're not Netflix, and you have to work out a solution geared to your product or service. We're talking about a disagreement. 
Eventually, individuals seeking happiness and fulfillment at work have difficulties to commit when they disagree with the decision or a choice of the company. Disagreement is part of work and life. How can we deal with that? How can we make people commit when they disagree with the company or with the team? Hello? I mean, I think that um, a lot of the reason why disagreement goes wrong is because, firstly, uh, there's a culture in the organization, an implicit culture, that says that disagreement shouldn't happen. And therefore, if it does happen, there's a problem. Now, what we need in an organization is a culture of good disagreeing. In other words, it's totally normal to disagree. Uh, when you disagree, you should talk about it, you should express it. But, and this is the last one, um, once a decision is taken collectively for the collective good by the leadership, everyone, even those who initially disagreed with it, have to go along with it. Right? This is the basic principle of um, any successful organization. You cannot have half the organization still stuck in the mode of disagreement. And I think that shows the balance between authority and representation within a good organization. Um, you know, I think part of the problem sometimes in the modern world is that we have a real problem with the concept of authority. We think that all authority is bad. Okay? Authority is sometimes good, sometimes bad. It is not always positive or negative. But you cannot have a good organization without some kind of hierarchy and some kind of degree of authority. Now, hopefully that authority will be good, kind, judicious, wise, and all the things we want authority to be. But you cannot have simply total chaos. And I think, you know, I've looked at organizations where literally everybody says, well, that's his point of view. That's her point of view. I've got my point of view. And you go, yeah, okay, we've heard everybody's view, but at some point we have to reach a consensus and move on. And then there are a few people around the table just going, no, but I feel something and I need to express my feeling. And you think, oh my goodness, this is a, a large cultural problem around people feeling that if you have a feeling, it has to be expressed. If it's expressed, it needs to win the day. And if it can't win the day, it has to keep being alive and has to keep raising its flag. Uh, this is, you know, this is about maturity. And some organizations pick up the immaturity of the surrounding society. And um, I think there is nothing evil. In fact, there is something very beautiful about an organization that listens and then eventually says, we're going this way. As an organization, we're going this way. And um, a good organization knows how to do that uh, without creating too much dissent. Well, uh, to, I, mean, I completely agree with Alan said. So just, just, to try, just trying to add something uh, on that, on that uh, reflection, I would say that um, normally we don't have the courage to disagree especially when authority is in place. So what we found that is very unique to foster the productive disagree disagreement is to have a trust set up, top down, when different opinions doesn't add, add, don't mean that we don't like each other or we don't have a common uh, purpose shared among us. I mean, we, it's very normal to have different perspectives about the same topic. So I think trust is one, one part of the question. The, the, the other thing is if you have a sense of purpose, you, I mean, you, you, you don't need to be very attached with your own opinions and, uh, and, uh, and the way that you position yourself. When, what we see in top management teams is that somehow, sometimes, the main purpose of the meeting is lost because people are trying to make their position their position is stronger in the conversation so there is no way of getting rid of that kind of disagreement if we don't have a common goal uh, in 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 the middle of the question just some questions on values um... In your global experiences, what are the main values and purpose that the companies present or position themselves to attract and learn with talent people? 
um, what are what are the the main successful uh, values in the companies in the global environment? The question was around values. I think um, uh, one of, one of the th one of the uh, uh, th uh, one of the topics that I shared in, in, in my introduction was the need, the aspiration of everyone to be part of something that have an uh, impact on society and uh, on earth in a broader uh, way. So I think when we are, what, 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 when we are talking about shared values, uh, one of the things that I would highlight is uh, the, the the chance that any organization can have to set up uh, uh, some values that can be shared beyond the life of the company itself. Uh, because that could be very uh, important for engagement in general. I agree. And sorry, by the way, what we were talking about is that slowly we should let everybody go back to work. Um, so this is our last, uh, our last question, um, our last answer, sorry. Um, that was brilliant. I mean, all I would want to uh, add is that mostly within an organization that has a problem around values and purpose, there is somebody, normally the CEO, who's got the values and purpose locked away in their heart. They know the values and purpose of the organization. They've forgotten to tell everybody else. Partly out of shyness, partly they didn't know such a thing was possible, um, partly they didn't know it would interest anyone. Uh, various reasons of kind of shyness and modesty and busyness. So I think part of the role of outsiders, perhaps like us, is to, is to try and find the value and purpose that is already there, because often it is already there. You know, if you're running a successful corporation of any kind, you probably have values and purposes, it's just that the people lower down in the organization don't know about it. So we come back to a theme of storytelling again. Those values and purposes need to be extracted from your heart and put in a format that is comprehensible to a wide number of people and repeat it constantly. Because the other thing about values and purposes, it's no use stating it once at the Christmas party. You need it every week. Uh, and you need to embed it within small moments and, and, and large moments. On that note, I think you've all got to get back to your values and purposes and, and your work. But thank you so much from both of us. And um, it's been a great pleasure. Um, did you want to say anything? No, just, no, just, uh, just to, to say that we, we thank you uh, both uh, very much. Uh, for this opportunity, uh, and uh, Unibis and all the sponsors of this meeting, thank you very much, and uh, have a nice day. Thank you.